Hi everyone, today I'd like to talk through the mechanism of three different reactions in organic chemistry, all of which use a hydroxyl group in the beta position to a ketone to do a diastereoselective reduction. That means that we can form 1,3 diols in very high diastereoselectivity. These transformations can be really useful in complex molecule synthesis, particularly those with loads of stereochemistry, such as polyketides, and these transformations are often post-reaction modifications after an aldol reaction. Right then, so first up is a 1,3 reduction, and what I'm going to describe now is sometimes called a Narasaka reduction. Organic chemists do love their named reactions. I'm just going to start here with my beta hydroxy ketone, and note that that beta center is a stereo center. And the idea is I'd like to reduce this carbonyl down to a hydroxyl group, but also selectively form one stereo center there too. Now, if I were just, just chuck something like sodium borohydride in, I'd expect to get close to a one-to-one -one mixture of diastereomers here. The carbonyl center is readily accessible from both sides, and there's nothing much going on near the bergy dunnitz angles that are important for nucleophilic attack. Might not be perfectly one-to-one -one here, just because the starting material is chiral. So the intermolecular reaction isn't really a way forward, unless we can do something that stops the molecule just freely rotating around here. And specifically, the way forward is to add this dibutyl boron lewis acid. So that boron has an empty p orbital, but also it has a leaving group in that methoxide. So this compound is a bidentate lewis acid. That means that we can coordinate to both of these oxygen lone pairs on our beta hydroxy ketone, lose methanol, and tie up our compound into a six membered ring that looks something like this. There'll be a negative charge on the boron because it's four coordinate here. And sneakily at the same time, we've activated that carbonyl as an electrophile. So now we've got a six membered ring. There are some low energy conformations of this molecule now, and it will prefer to sit in the one with the least strain, as in if there's a choice to put groups equatorial, they'll go equatorial. Just identifying that six membered ring conformation there, we've got two sp2 centers in there, so the lowest energy conformation will be a half chair. So I'll just draw the two lowest energy conformations. I'm going to put my sp2 centers at the front here, and just going backwards, I can complete my half chair, something like this. That's activating the carbonyl. It's a negative charge on the boron because there's two other substituents, so it's two butyl groups. This should be one of the two conformers, and I can just draw the other conformer quite quickly here. By rather than taking this zigzag up the top first, I can take that down below and the ring system will look like this. Now there's an R group coming forwards on the ketone. So the stereo center is tucked away at the back here on both of these diagrams indicated by the red star. There are two positions, a pseudo axial and a pseudo equatorial on both of these two structures. And we need to assign an R prime or a hydrogen onto each of those. So tracing around the 3D, the one on the left has the R prime in the pseudo equatorial position and the hydrogen in the pseudo axial position. And flipping the conformer, the R prime will end up up in pseudo axial and the hydrogen will be down and pseudo equatorial. So there's a major steric problem for this R prime on the right hand structure, and the preferred conformation will be the one on the left. This is the lowest energy conformer. So what we do is we stir this around for a bit to form this complex. And once we're sure we've left it long enough, we'll add in a hydride reducing agent. Quite common is lithium borohydride here. And because we've left it long enough, there'll be none of the uncomplexed ketone in there. So for attack onto the activated ketone, we could still attack from the top or the bottom, as drawn here, but there's a big kinetic preference for nucleophiles to attack this sort of ring system from the bottom face. This is because you go via a chair-like transition state, which is the lowest energy of the possible transition states available. Attack from the top face is via a twist boat-like transition state, which is just higher in energy. So really, we want to do this reaction at a low temperature or as low as we can get away with to maximize our diastereoselectivity. Now, we can play around with the 3D in that if you want to, but the important thing to note is that the hydrogen is coming from the bottom face of that ketone as drawn right at it, over at the start. So after workup, the hydroxyl group is coming forwards because the hydrogen has been delivered from the back face. And this will form in high diastereoselectivity, so that's high DR for the one free syn diol. And you can check that you form the correct diastereomer using NMR experiments, normally by forming the acetonide between these two hydroxyl groups. Now, moving on, in our complex molecule synthesis, we might actually want the 1 3 anti diol rather than the 1 3 syn. So, we need to play another game with the molecule. And rather than forming a chelated complex to fix a conformation, we can set up an intramolecular reaction, as in tethering in a hydride nucleophile to get selectivity for reduction via some sort of cyclic transition state. And there's two main ways people might go about doing this, and they have pros and cons each. The first is an evans succina reduction, just taking my beta hydroxy ketone that I had before. And I'm going to use another boron-based reagent, trimethylammonium triacetoxyborohydride. 
and I'm going to do this reaction in a mixture of acetic acid and acetonitrile as my solvents. Again, we need to do this at a low temperature, but that solvent mixture normally forces you to go down to an absolute minimum of minus 30 degrees C, otherwise the solvent mixture freezes. So this time we definitely don't have a Lewis acid in here, we just have a nucleophile. But instead, we've tethered on some good leaving groups. The pKAH of an acetate ion is about 5, so quite a stable negative charge. So the idea is to use our hydroxyl groups lone pairs again, but do a ligand exchange and attach our reducing agent directly to the molecule. Now, luckily, we're doing this under acidic conditions because that borohydride reducing agent is really weak. It can't just attack a ketone so easily without this pre-coordination. And in fact, even when it's coordinated, it requires this acid activation by a proton. So this is an important control element because it means that this intermediate is reduced much faster than the starting material. And if anything were to attack that starting material, there'd be no diastereo selectivity. So that hydride center is six atoms away from the ketone and we can deliver intramolecularly like this. So we've got a six member ring transition state there. So I'll just try and draw it in 3D. The key point is going to be that there's a stereo center. So we're gonna to have to choose where we put our R prime, but also there are two substituents on the left-hand side here coming off the ring. So we're gonna to need to choose which one we want to put pseudo equatorial there as well. I'm just gonna put a hydrogen on that hydroxyl stereo center there, just for clarity in this drawing. But my plan is to rotate this bond here forwards. So flopping the hydroxyl group forwards towards me. So this will be my hydroxyl group. That will move the hydrogen in red up into the pseudo-axial position, and the remaining R group will be pseudo-equatorial to the ring that I'm just drawing now. Next thing along is the attached nucleophile. There's a couple of acetoxies on there, and the remaining hydrogen can take the final place in the transition state to deliver to the front face of the activated ketone, something like this. In fact, it might be much easier to see the stereochemistry in this one. Just in yellow, I have a zigzag going between my two R groups which is actually exactly how I've drawn it in the starting material. So we can see the new hydride has been delivered from the front face. So after workup, I'll have this 1,3 anti-diol in high DR. Now I just want to talk through an alternative to this reduction, which has a sneaky extra feature that can be really useful in complex molecule synthesis. So I want to talk through the evans toshenko reduction as well. Yet again, I'll use this same starting material, beta-hydroxy ketone, but instead, I'm going to treat it with samarium diiodide, which is both Lewis acidic and a single electron reducing agent, and also propanaldehyde. Now, just an aside to start with, when you use samarium diiodide, a solution of the plus two oxidation state is a really dark royal blue color, and samarium in its plus three oxidation state is a yellow solution. When you do this reaction, you see the blue color turn to yellow. So the metal that could be involved in this process could either be the samarium two itself, or it could be the samarium-3 that's formed in situ. For example, the samarium-2 can oxidize in the presence of the aldehyde via a pinnacle-type reaction. So I'm going to leave my transition state for my evans tachenko reduction a bit ambiguous. It doesn't actually matter which oxidation state of the samarium we're using. I'm just conscious that samarium-3 is probably more oxyphilic. So I'm just going to use the samarium in square brackets here to say that I'm not showing anything about the oxidation state or the ligands. Now, the activation of the samarium allows an acetyl to form with our beta hydroxyl stereo center. So now very like in the evans succina reduction above, we've made a species with a hydrogen dangling six atoms away from the carbonyl electrophilic center. In fact, more so than that, the samarium is almost certainly going to be working as a Lewis acid as well to activate that carbonyl. So these reagent conditions set up both of this for us just in a slightly different way. We should also note that internal activation of the samarium as a Lewis acid is also a six-membered ring. So this transition state is thought to be very highly ordered. Now there's an interesting difference for the actual mechanism here in that while that hydride gets transferred, we end up with an ester as the product instead of the diol, also in very high DR for this particular diastereomer. Now having the ester in there means that we now have actually chemically differentiated the two hydroxyl groups, whereas we can see from the evans succina reduction, they're both two three hydroxyl groups. Now, this might be really useful in your complex molecule synthesis, as, for example, you'd be able to differentially protect those two stereocenters. That may be useful, may not be useful. If you want to do something really fancy with this reaction, right at the start, you can vary your aldehyde and install something different in this position. And you could install a whole other complex molecule as a side chain during the course of this reduction. Pretty neat. So we can draw the transition state just like with the evans succina one. So I'll just draw it in the gap below. It's largely going to look the same. So there's my zigzag connecting my R groups. Coming forward is the hydroxyl. And this time I have an acetal at the front, but this time I still have the hydride delivering as a nucleophile at the front. 
Now the acetal has a samarium on it and the samarium is helping to activate the ketone. So I can draw another six membered chair at the top here with the samarium and that's our mechanism again. If you found this discussion useful, please do give the video a like and subscribe to my channel. That really does help me plan what sort of things to talk about in my future videos. On the screen now is a selection of other organic chemistry discussions that I've had. I hope you enjoy.